All right, good evening. This is Wednesday Night Bible Study, <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 7. <clears throat> this is the second week on the issue of judge not that ye be not judged. This passage is often quoted in the relation of uh, individuals trying to defend specific behavior or behavior that somebody might consider to be inappropriate or uh, actions that they are doing that others consider to be wrong or sinful or not expedient or whatever it might be. And so people will immediately jump out and say, whoa, 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 wait, are you re rebuking me? Are you reproofing me? Are you, are, are you telling me I can't do that? Stop judging me. So when, when we look at the term judgment, we have to remember that does not always mean to condemn because in the, the truth of the situation, the reality of the situation is that the whole world stands before God condemned, therefore the whole world is judged by God as condemned. So that, it's, that's, not, that's not a, there's no, dis, there's no disagreeing whether or not somebody's condemned or not. Make sense? So the other issue becomes, okay, in a discernment sense, what is behavior that is acceptable and what is behavior that is unacceptable, right? So is that something that you should be doing? Is it profitable or is it not profitable? So when you look at that word judgment, make sure that you're clear of, of what the intent behind the judgment is. Judgment where people will say, you can't judge, judge not, judge, don't you read the Bible, you're not supposed to judge. Those are the same people, as I said, that will sit there and watch the, 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 you know, the Kaylee Casey Anthony case and say, ring her neck, kill her, kill her, right? What are you doing? Judge not, judge not, right? And they'll say, well, wait, 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 there's certain circumstances in which judgment is acceptable. Well, hold on a second. Now, now you are making a judgment in relation to when judgment is acceptable. Make sense? So what it comes down to is that judgment is inherent in everything that we do. We make judgments. We make discernments about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going to put on. Those are decisions based upon facts. And so when the court system does their judgment, that is part of what the jury does. The jury makes findings of fact. And that's the conclusions that they draw based upon the finding of fact to then go ahead and issue what we consider be a render, you know, a judgment, right? We render that judgment. We say that is unacceptable. That is not acceptable. The, the things that have become acceptable as of late have become, you know, a prime usage of this verse. It's the prime time to go out and throw this verse in the person's face. And it's a really good time for you to go back and really understand the verse and say, well, hold on. That is true. The scripture does talk much about judgment. It actually says, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. And it actually says that, the, that Jesus Christ has been committed all judgment and that I'm going to stand with Jesus Christ and judge the entire world. Not only the world, I'm going to judge all angels. So all of a sudden, people are going, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense, right? It is a very little thing, Paul says, to be judged. A very small thing to be judged by you, right? It doesn't, doesn't really matter. You know, that, that's the very small, minute aspect. Because why man's judgment is usually inherently flawed. Now, if we were doing true judgment, pure righteous judgment, which, which is Christ says in John 7, 24, judge righteous judgment, what you would find is you would find the whole world again coming back and going, wow, sounds like I need the gospel. As we discussed, when you present the gospel message, inherent implied in every gospel message is judgment. I don't care how you try to get around it, right? How you try to skirt the issue. Any Christian who says, I just don't judge people, that's incorrect, then you don't preach the gospel. Well, no, no, I preach the gospel. Well, then you judge every man, right? Because every man's a sinner and you judge them all. Well, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't do that. No, I, that's, that's God's decision to judge. Oh, no, actually, uh, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. We make discernments about what is good and evil. We make discernments about what is right and what is wrong. And we know what sin is and we call sin, sin. Well, you just don't judge specific people in relation to their sins. Oh, well. Pretty sure that I'll be standing at the judgment seat of Christ or and at the great white throne judgment with Jesus Christ judging the world. So I, that doesn't that doesn't work either, right? The reason why they say that is they want to to get out of anybody having authority or taking responsibility for the actions that they do. Their actions are wrong. Somebody's correcting their action and they don't like it. So what are they going to try to do? They're going to try to get out of having to be accountable. And so the scripture teaches that every man is accountable. We, we talked about those verses a couple weeks ago, and, and, and we're going to look at some of them today, that every man shall give an account of himself to God. And the accountable aspect is, those are the things that you say, those things that you do. As a, as a unbeliever, 
all those people are doing is they're simply treasuring up wrath, as we've discussed, till the day of wrath. And what does he say? The righteous judgment of who? Uh, of Jesus Christ, of God, in, in Romans chapter number 2, in verse 15. So you see those verses, you you kind of you kind of go like, well, it just seems so crazy. There's so many verses that talks about judgment. What what is it at the end of the day that we should be? What should we be thinking about in relation to judgment? Well, let's not believe the lie that you can't judge. Okay, you 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 should judge, and that is that you should see the whole world as being condemned and guilty before God, and you should preach to them the gospel, the grace of God, not imputing their trespasses unto them, but not saying that they don't have trespasses. You follow me how that works? When, when Christ says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, not imputing their trespasses unto them, he doesn't say as if they have no trespass, right? It's just like how they'll go immediately over, and the two verses that, they, that go hand in hand is the John 8 and, and John 7 and, and, and the Matthew 7, right? The, the, the Matthew 7 is the judge not. The John 7 and 8 is talking about what? The woman caught in adultery, which what's the next phrase that comes out of everybody's mouth when they say these things? He did us without sin, cast the first stone, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, great. I'm glad. I'm glad you're glad you're quoting scripture. That's great and all, but that doesn't change the fact that the woman was caught in adultery. She was guilty of the crime. She was condemned, and and the motive behind their condemnation of that woman was simply to do what? To bring Jesus Christ and make him do something that, right? That 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 they think that he was going to catch him in, right? Remember, they were trying to see if he would, you know, say that, yeah, Moses should stone her, you know, all that type of thing. Their motives were not pure in their judgment. They weren't saying, no, we are upholding the righteous judgment of God. In fact, they said the opposite. They're saying, well, you know, we're just going to do this to, who cares about the lady caught in adultery? We just want to see what you're going to say, Jesus. We want to catch you and see if you're really going to agree with this statement. And then Jesus Christ says, look, it's perfectly acceptable for you to stone this woman, right? There's no doubt in mind. He has to say that. Because Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law, he must enforce that law. But see, what he also has the power to do, no man can forgive sin but God, he can look at her straight in the eyes and say, "Um, yeah, I don't condemn you. Whoa. Because what does he say before that? See, you have to back up a little bit there and, and, and remember the statements that are going on. He looks at all of those men and he says, that's fine. He is without sin. Cast the first stone. Go for it. And that goes hand in hand with Matthew chapter 7. Because Matthew 7 says, judge not that ye be not judged. Because he says, for with with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. It doesn't say you should never judge. It says that you should judge not lest ye be judged. In other words, you better just not judge in the sense unless unless you're prepared and ready to accept the consequences of judgment, which is the reciprocation of judgment back upon yourself. So unless you're ready to have judgment all on you, then don't judge. And that's how it works. It's very true. If you're living a life that is horrible, not you know, exemplary of the gospel, not exemplary of Christ, and you go out and you're trying to you know, tell, witness to somebody and tell somebody, hey man, you, know, you should probably not be cheating on your wife so much. Dude, shut up. You're out there at the strip club. You went out with me three times on my bachelor pro-. And you're like, oh yeah, shoot. <laughs> well, oops. <laughs> you follow me how that's going to work. What are they doing? They're reciprocating the judgment. What does that really do at the end of the day? What does it prove? The whole world's guilty before God, right? It's all, it's all it does. It just comes back to the condemnation aspect. Does it change anything? Does it change their judgment position? Does, does the judgment of another, right? When I judge somebody and then they judge me back, does it change the truth of my judgment? No. What, what is it trying to do? It tries to deflect it. It tries to diffuse it. It tries to put the burden or the onus back upon me and make me do a self-evaluation, which is exactly how judgment should first occur. Judgment should be introspective first. That is, you should look at yourself on the inside, evaluate your position on the inside before you go on out and start telling people like, man, you have a dirty mouth. You stop cussing. Dude, I hear you all the time. Oh, yeah. oops, oops. You see how that works? It's not going to be very impactful. That's why when Christ came and he did some judgment, what happens? People have nothing to say but lies. That's all they could do. That's all they could muster up. See, if Jesus Christ came into the world and he was coming to bring condemnation, we had a, we had a major problem. We discussed in, in, the, in John chapter number 3, we read just a couple of those verses in the end. He says in verse number 17, 317, For God sent not his Son into the world to what? To condemn the world. Right? 
does the world really need to be condemned? They're already, they, they, they stand condemned, right? So what Jesus Christ did when he came into the world was not to condemn the world. He's already proven that they're already condemned. And this condemnation here is what we consider to be the damnation, right? It is that second death. He didn't come to bring them to hell and say, we're throwing you in the lake of fire. He came to give them a choice. He came to give them an opportunity. And in that opportunity, he grants them the opportunity to avoid judgment, right? So I've always looked at these verses, if you look with me at the book of Romans, just for a second, and, and I've read these verses before. Look at Romans chapter number 2, and when you read this, this passage, you go, whoa, 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 wait, 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 ha, 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 how can Paul say this? How can he say things like this, right? Remember, Paul's writing this epistle, right? He's writing this letter to the Romans, and in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. Well, well hold on a second. Didn't he just go up in verse number 28 of chapter 1 and say, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murders, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, I mean, doesn't that sound like a big role of judgment? Sounds like a big thing of judgment to me, right? Who knowing the what? Who knowing the judgment of God. Right? So, so people, people are, are impressed by nature, by God, their judgment. They know it. They know it happens. That's why when you're a little kid, I'm going to give you the example. We were just at Disney World. Okay? And while we were at Disney World, my son, was, we were going on the aerial ride. And outside of the aerial Little Mermaid ride, there is the little area of rocks that you can, that are, you know, it's just typical, like, uh, the, the atmosphere of, of the scenery. There you go. The atmosphere of the scenery. And Noah goes and he steps up on the rocks. And then one of the workers says, no, no, no. You know, don't climb on those rocks. And he immediately got like this. And then he started to cry and he ran over to me, right? Why? Because he knew what he did was wrong. And he probably knew ahead of time that he shouldn't have climbed those rocks. And he looks and the lady, you know, kind of says, no, 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 don't climb on those rocks. And then he runs to me because he's sad and he's sorrowful in what he did. But now the world, what it does, as you get into sin and as you're more involved in it, as, you're, as it's more common in your life and as it becomes more and more uh, inundated in what you do, you become desensitized to the sin. You become desensitized to the actions that you do. And as a result, you, d you dismiss the object or ideology that you're having any judgment because nobody around you is, is standing up for what is right or what is righteous, right? I mean, anybody ever remember as a little kid? Philip might remember this. I don't know if you ever came to Keswick. There was the do right guy. Do you remember that? He would, he, it was this like guy and dressed in the costume, kind of like Superman. And he'd be like, do right till the stars fall, do right. Do, and they're just instilling you to do right, do right, do right, do right, right, right. Try, try to stand up for what is right. Try to stand up for what is righteous. And in this day and age, you're going to have a major problem or dilemma in that because as I said, you become desensitized to the righteousness. And then it just becomes like, you know, you're just trying to be better than me when that's actually not the motive or the, 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 the concept of what anybody that should be doing proper judgment is trying to do. They're not trying to say, I'm better than you. That is, in other words, to say that I'm just a little less sinful than you are, when in fact everybody is equally sinful in the eyes of God. That is, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and there is none righteous, no, not one. So when you read these verses here, and he goes through all this stuff about being wicked and maliciousness and envy and murder and debate, Paul is guilty of all of those things, okay? Backbiters, haters of God. Read Paul's life. Saul of Tarsus is a backbiter. Saul of Tarsus was a hater of God. Saul of Tarsus murdered. Saul of Tarsus had deceit and a whisper and a backbiter and malignity and all kinds of things that he did, right? So you go, well, hold on a second. How is he going to say this, right? How does he escape the judgment of God? Well, isn't that the question that it says in verse number three of Romans chapter two? And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest, which doest do such things and doest the same, that thou should escape the judgment of God? Okay, well, Paul, you did that. You're going to escape the judgment of God? What's the answer? And so the question is, yes, he, he, did, he does escape the judgment of God. If you read verse number two, look what he says. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against who? Against them. You see how Paul is making this break, this distinction between us and them? He's seeing a distinction between the saved individuals who possess the knowledge and the unsaved individuals who repress that knowledge. And when you see this verse here where he says, we are sure the judgment of God is according to truth, therein lies the major dilemma of all judgment. You simply do not believe 
what I'm saying is true. That's it. When you go out and you judge somebody for the sin that they commit and you say, hey, look, you shouldn't be committing that sin, right? No, I can do that. That's fine. I'm, I, that's, that's, that's not a sin. That's, that's okay. Or you, you're just doing something else. Any of those things are just a distraction from the truth. We need to get back to the truth and the realization that, look, judgment is inherent and implied in the gospel message. You're going to have to do it. It's going to have to be there. And the, and the less that you spend on judgment, the, the more you weaken the cross and the more you, you, you really minimize the effectiveness of the righteous mercy of God and his grace. Grace is amplified only when what happens? Only where sin abounds. So the more sin that is amplified, the more grace can abound. And the more grace that abounds provides for what? Less of you, right? You see how when you preach grace, when you preach the mercy and grace of God, and you preach the sinfulness of man, and you show how sinful man is, and yet you show the grace and mercy of God, what you do is you minimize God, or you minimize man's righteousness, and you just, just absolutely elevate God to a position of pure righteousness. And, and it's, just, it's just the way that the gospel, it should be preached. And unfortunately, it's not. And, and we get people saying that I can't judge. I can't say anything that's negative about uh, any type of sin. Come on, folks. That's not true. What happens at the judgment seat of God? What happens at the great white throne judgment? Does God just not judge anybody? Is that what he just does? He just says, okay, no judgment time. If, if that's how it is, if there's no judgment to be had, please turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 23. If there's no judgment, it's just not allowed. You know, they love to say, well, you're not God. You can't judge. Well, that's, that's okay. I, I, I'm in his son. It's as close as I can be to God himself. And uh, I will judge the world. I will stand with God and judge the world. And everybody else who is in Christ will do the same thing. If you think that you, sh you can't judge, you should read some of these verses like Matthew chapter 23. And uh, I mean, I could just read the whole passage. I, I really like it a lot. But Matthew 23 from verse number like 13, for example. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For neither you go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Whoa. Uh, what is that telling you? It's telling you people are preaching false doctrine, right? That's what he's telling. He's saying, you're preaching false doctrine. You're hypocrites. You think that you're going in the kingdom of heaven. You're not going in. And not only are you not going in, you're making everybody else stand at the door and be you know, kicked out because you're not preaching the gospel. You don't know what the gospel of the kingdom is. So how is that any, how is there, how is a real life application today to how it's, it's any different? Well, you're a Catholic and you're really preaching works-based salvation very vehemently. And the scripture makes it very clear that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And that, that to him that worketh not, but, 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 you know, but him that believeth, his faith is kind of for righteousness, right? So all these verses that you can go through, you go, well, what am I doing? I'm just trying to prove to you the truth. And what is the reception? It's going to be the same as the reception of Jesus Christ. See, really when people understand Jesus Christ, he's not very well received. Why? Because men are vehemently against the, the ideology that they've done wrong or that they, that they need some help or that somehow they're, they're sinners. They don't like that. They don't like to be told that they're sinners. The, all, the only thing I have to do, I said it last night to Noah when I was sitting up there. I said, hey, come here. He goes, what? I said, w what happened? He goes, when? What? And he gets kind of like serious, right? He's like, what? 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 You're like, what? I said, the other day at Disney. And he goes, uh, what? I said, remember on the aerial ride? And he goes, yeah. And I said, what happened? He goes, I climbed on the rock and I got it. And he starts to cry, right? He's, I mean, just, just like that, that quick, that quick. He sees it. He, he sees what's, he sees it's wrong. But you try to do that to somebody else, what happens? Get out of my face. You don't know what you're talking about. Blah, 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 blah. And they just want to just mouth off and mouth off. And they just want, they want to be that way. And so you have to understand that that's going to occur. But so as we get back to this issue of judgment and we look at these verses, oh, you know, this whole thing in Matthew 23 is a judgment. This whole thing is a judgment. Well, it's not a judgment to condemnation. Uh, it's not? Okay. Matthew 23, 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Oh, I'm sorry. That's not condemnation? Right? That's absolutely condemnation. <laughs> You do preach that the world is condemned. They stand in a position of condemnation. Okay? You want to know how that works? Turn with me back to John 3 just for a second. Most people don't understand this, but, you know, I said that Christ Jesus came not into the world to condemn the world. People are like, see, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world. 
And I'm always like, oh my goodness. Let, let, go, go with me just for a second. Um... Look at John 3, verse 18, okay? Just, 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 ready? Christ Jesus came along. He didn't come in to condemn anybody. He just came to be nice Jesus. He'd love all the gays. He would hang out with the prostitutes. He'd go to the porn shops and the strip clubs, and he would go do all these things, and he would just be the friend of sinners. He would love on sinners. And you go like, well, okay, I mean, obviously he cares about sinners. That's, that's why he came to the world. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who, as Paul says, he was chief. See, Paul had the right mentality about that sinfulness. That, look, <laughs> if you want to you know who's, you should be having arguments about who's worse, not who's better, right? Why? Because the worse you are, the more grace you've received, right? He says, of me, of whom the least of these saints is this great grace given, right? He's, this, to him, it's still somewhat unbelievable. Of course, he believes it, but it's somewhat unbelievable to him. It's like, how, how did I get this? How did this happen? Right? And when you experience such grace, what do you want to do? You want, you want to make sure everybody else can experience that same grace too. So when you read in John chapter 3, when they see people, oh, well, Jesus never condemns anybody. He never, well, we just read verses that he does. How can you escape the, the damnation of hell? Okay. It doesn't get any clearer than that. He's condemning those individuals. He's condemning them because what? He's simply preaching the truth, as this verse says, that they are condemned already. Right? He doesn't have to do anything. You're already condemned. You stand condemned. The whole world stands condemned. Right? Does God owe the world anything? People always say, well, it's not fair that, that God would come into the world and send Jesus Christ, but, but he wouldn't let him go talk to the, the deep, dark tribes of Brazil. Well, let me ask you this. Does God owe the deep, dark tribes of Brazil anything? Does he owe you anything? Awesome people are like, oh, oh. The answer to the question is no. He doesn't know anybody anything, okay? So if you like to go talk to the deep, dark tribes of Brazil, go drive down there and go do it. Go, go, go get a plane ticket. You can make it happen. Or you can continue your Netflix subscription and sit on your butt. Make a choice. See, when you read John 3 and verse number 18, it says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. So in the gospel of the kingdom, just like today, he that believeth on him is not condemned. The position that Paul stood at when he wrote Romans chapter number 2 was not condemned. We know that the judgment of God is against truth against those people, right? Against them. He says, but he that believeth not is condemned all what? Already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. The only way for them in the gospel of the kingdom to obtain the forgiveness, to relieve themselves of the condemnation of God, is to simply believe. You see how that works? And look what he says. This is the condemnation. I like how it says, this is, this is really good. And this is the condemnation. Here's the real condemnation. The condemnation comes out when everybody finds out that they're condemned. They think they're not condemned. They think that God's not going to judge them. They think, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And it's like, you, you mistake how God loves and how God judges. Those are not mutually exclusive, right? He's going to judge, yet he loves so much. And the reason why he judges is because he loves so much. When you read verse number 19, it says, and this is the condemnation. Note this, note this. This is just how it works today. And this is the condemnation that light has come to the world, a.k.a. the truth. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He that believeth on me, yet he were, th though he were dead, yet shall he live, Right? When you read this verse, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, here is the condemnation. The light is simply just the truth of the gospel through Jesus Christ. When they hear about it, that's the condemnation. You see how it works? He's exposing their condemned state, just like you do when you read Romans 1 through 319, right? Until you get to the good stuff in 320. Before you get to 320, you read Romans 1 to through 319, you're condemned. That's your state. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Therefore, what do they not want to hear? You're a sinner. You're wrong. You're doing bad things, right? When you see the people at the, like the Westboro Baptist, right? And they put up their signs and they say all kinds of things. Do they point out a lot of legitimate, verified sins? Sure. 
A lot of what they say is true. Yes, those individuals are committing heinous acts of sin, right? Now, their motive is completely wrong in that they're doing it in a, if you don't stop that thing, God's going to send you to hell type of deal, which, well, let's take the sinfulness of yourself and evaluate it underneath the law of Moses, and then I'll condemn you as well. So therefore, you can see how that, that works. But it doesn't change the fact that they are true in what they say, that, that, that there is a judgment of condemnation upon those individuals, especially those that do such things. It's stated right there in Romans chapter number 2. So he says, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. And here's the reason why, okay? Here's the last reason why. Here's why people don't like judgment. Because judgment doesn't just simply mean I'm condemned. It means what? That there is a truth that I know now, I am now charged with knowledge on, yet I have the decision to either believe it or reject it. And that's the concept of reproof. And that's why he says, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be, what? Reproofed. Okay? How hard is that to see? How, how difficult of an understanding is this? Is anybody like confused and they just go, I don't understand how this really works. I need more mechanics on the breakdown of how we should supposed to judge. Well, I mean, do you want me to give you more examples or, or what, would, what would really help? Well, go back to Matthew 5, verse 7. You don't even need to go very far because the example's right there. Go back to Matthew 7. Look what he says. Judge not that ye be not judged. That's the way it works. You notice it again? Judge not that ye be not judged. So he's basically saying, careful, because when you judge, it's coming right back at you. Just like what I said last week when I was a little kid and you'd point your finger at somebody and go, nah, 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 right? And the teacher would be like, well, you got one finger pointing at him and you got three fingers pointing back at you. And you're like, oh, okay. Right? Anybody remember that? I mean, that was like, I feel like, I feel like the teacher said that all the time when I was growing up. Kids would be pointing, he did this and he did that and he did this. And then what happens? Teacher's like, look, you got three fingers right back at you. You're sure you were complete? Oh, I was complicit. I did things wrong too. So when you see these verses, judge not that you be not judged, it's the reason why. For, because, because with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. How much leniency you give somebody on an issue is how much leniency they will give back to you. If you're very lenient in relation to judgment and saying like, oh, I'm just going to let that skate by, they're going to let that skate by. Oh, we're going to let that be okay. They're going to let that be okay. You know what that's called? It's called our court system. It's called how the court system works. One court's like, yeah, that's acceptable. We'll let that slide now. That's our interpretation of the law. What do their courts have to do? Well, it depends upon the authority and the precedent, but sometimes it becomes binding and it becomes mandatory. Other or other jurisdictions in which it's not, you know, in the same, you know, area or, or state or or maybe it's in a different area of, 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 a, of a district or whatever it could be, it becomes persuasive, right? You see how this works? It's the same concept right here. With what measure you meet, it should measure to you again. It's the leniency or it's the strictness that's applied. So going on in verse number three, here is the example. Here it is. It's not hard to see. The example is very easy. And why beholdest thou? What does it start with? And why beholdest thou? You're looking in the wrong place starting your judgment. Because he says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. So he goes, look, it's introspection first. You are completely, 100% allowed to call the moat out of your brother's eye. Why? You know what you're doing? I mean, there's verses that talks about pulling somebody out of the fire. You've heard that before, that phrase? I pulled them out of the fire. That comes from the scripture. And the reason why they say that is they say, I pulled somebody from hell, right? I saved somebody from a life of, of, of just absolute misery and condemnation to, to the gospel, the grace of God, or whatever it might be. So when you see these verses with, with this, this or, 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 or what he says, the beam that is in the inner eye, that introspection that is necessary to then proceed forward and go out is, is absolutely necessary for, especially today, the body of Christ. The body requires introspection to then help out the rest of the body. If you're part of the body, you better take care of yourself first. If you got some cancer growing, you better cut it out. If you got an ingrown toenail, just knock that thing out, whatever. You got an ear infection, knock it out, you know? It's all part of the body. So what he's trying to teach you is that, look, the other parts of the body that are sick, do you just let them be sick? What does Paul say? He says, he that sins, rebuke before all that others may fear. But not only that, what are you supposed to do? Just to help them. 
Paul says this in, 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 uh, in Titus chapter 2. You know what he says? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying godliness and more or less, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And you know what he goes on to talk about next? Read with me. Go to Titus. Verse number 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for, for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, he might purify himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. I can guarantee you that if you were to preach any type of judgment, men will despise you. But especially to the believers inside, you should definitely judge them and help them in the judgment, right? The judgment is not to say, oh, we're just going to condemn you to hell. That's not the judgment, right? I mean, at some points, Paul gets so fed up with it in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He goes, I, I pray that, that, that we can just deliver such an one into Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of Lord Jesus. And the reason why I want to do that is because he's so detrimental to the body. He's such a cancer. And he need, I'd rather just him be gone. Wow. You know what he says very similar to that? It's those that preach the gospel of works. I, I, I wish that those guys would be cut off from you. Get them out of here. It's the same thing. The super sinfulness and the false doctrine, it's offensive and harmful to the body of Christ. When you go back and you read that verse in Titus chapter 2 and you see where he says, these things speak and rebuke or, you know, with all authority, let no man despise thee. He adds that, let no man despise thee because he knows that all men are going to despise you because of it and that just because men despise you for righteous judgment does not mean that when you rebuke and you reprove and you exhort that you stop because a man despises you. Pretty clear to me. Not difficult to see. How are Christians so messed up with this? They're so messed up because probably 98% of people who call themselves Christians are going to hell. That's the sad part because they don't even know what the gospel is. They literally can't even tell you what the gospel is. What is the gospel? Oh, John 3, 16? Uh, wrong answer. Duh, duh, duh. Uh, try again. Uh, that's the only verse I know. <laughs> wow. Wow, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and you think that's a joke, but it's, it's really true. I mean, that, that's just how it goes. Talk to people. Jason, you're so, you're so condescending on others involved in Christianity. And I, I, no, I'm not condescending. It's how I have dialogue on a regular basis with individuals. And, and I've, I've yet to run into somebody that's a believer. I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, people who call themselves believers, and, and they don't know the gospel, right? So my assumption is that they're not. That's how I work. I, I go, okay, you don't know the gospel. If you can't tell me. I, I would be, I would be uh, uh, thrilled. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm even or thrilled is maybe, maybe too, too low. I, I need to find another synonym that's even greater. I would be ecstatic. I would be jumping up and down if somebody said, hey, man, I heard you're a believer. Can you tell me your testimony? Pfft, wouldn't you be excited to tell somebody? Wouldn't you be excited to talk to somebody about the gospel, how you came to know what the gospel is, and then how you came to the knowledge of the truth? Isn't that something that you get excited about? Isn't that something you want to talk about? It is with me. And so I was going, so, so wait, 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 wait. Why is it when I ask some people, I've, had, I've actually asked the guy one time, I asked him about his testimony, he says, that's a personal issue. It's a personal matter. Yeah, it's a personal matter being among the body of Christ, so let me hear it. Wouldn't tell me. It's weird. Weird stuff. It's a personal issue. Per personal. It's not. It's a personal decision that you make, but, but me inquiring about it, it should not be something that is like, oh man, you know, I'm fine with somebody asking whether or not I'm saved. I'm fine with somebody asking if I don't know. Do you know what the gospel is? You know, are you going to heaven? Are you sure? That'd be great. I'd love to hear it. And there's been many a times. I can tell you, I can probably tell you 10 plus examples over the last five years. One time I was at a Wendy's. I'll give you an example. One time I was at a Wendy's and I was sitting there. And uh, this is when I still bowed my head and closed my eyes when I prayed to eat. And I stopped doing that recently over the last couple of years because I felt it was a little bit ostentatious or I didn't really need to, it, was, it wasn't necessary to make a scene. You know, I, I noticed that people would come up to me and this is why I actually stopped doing it. Uh, I, I was praying in a Wendy's. I, I bowed my head and closed my eyes and prayed for my food. And this guy comes up to me halfway through my meal and he says, I just want to let you know, I, I appreciate you praying for your food before you, uh, uh, you know, you ate it. And I said, well, yeah, you know, I, I want to thank the Lord God for what he's, you know, he's given me and I, I, I appreciate it. And I looked at him, I said, uh, I said, are you a believer yourself? And he looked at me. He goes, yeah, yes, sir, I am. 
And I says, do you know you have eternal life? And I get, I get right to the heart of it, right? Like, I don't even, like, I don't, like, I don't stop it. I'm not like, oh, so you're a believer. Okay, cool. We're believers together. I hit him. I, like, get him square on the justification issue. Oh, so you're justified unto eternal life, right? You have all your sins forgiven. You're going to see Christ when you die for sure. And sometimes I get the people like, oh, yeah, absolutely, no doubt. And that's rare, very rare. I just had it happen the other day, but it's pretty rare. The majority of people kind of look at me like, well, you know, I hope so. You know what the answer to that guy is? Lost. Lost. Doesn't know the gospel. Doesn't know it. Doesn't understand it. Hasn't heard it. So I go and preach it to him. And so the guy this one time, I, I preached to him, and he was, um, I, I, I talked to him for a while. And he says, I go to, uh, he's part of like the, the, not Quaker, the Brethren churches, whatever they're called. Uh, Plymouth, Plymouth Brethren. Have you heard of that? So it's like a, more of a... I don't know what you would consider it. It's like old, old Baptist almost, like that type of thing. But he's like, uh, yeah, you should you should come check out our church sometime. Do, do, do. And he, he, he was a nice guy, but I, I had to preach the gospel pretty hard to him on, for about 15 minutes while I was sitting there in Wendy's. And that's that's Wendy's. I can tell you story after story in Wendy's. That's just where I go all the time. But people end up talking to me quite a bit there. So, you know, going, going through all this, looking at these verses, I want to go back to Matthew 7 just for a second and we'll close. He says, you know, or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine own eye, right? So look here, how wilt thou say to thy brother? How, how are you going to say this? Look, dude, didn't you read what I said? For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Here's how it works. How are you going to go through all this thing? Let me pull out the moat of thine own eye. Moat, little tiny, little tiny, little speck of a thing. When you yourself, he says, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, right? Man, he's like, look, dude, here's what you need to do. You got to get this out. He says, verse 5, thou hypocrite. Remember what he says here, judge not that you be not judged? That's the hypocrite aspect, right? Stop cursing. Oh, 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 dude, I heard you the other day on the boat. Oh, yeah, oops. Right? See how that works? You're gonna get you're gonna get the bounce back. Now it doesn't it doesn't change it. A good mature believer will go, you know what, you're right. You're right, yeah. See how that works? Wow. Not, well, you know, dude. When you say, you know what, you're right. Now the issue slides back upon you, right? You're right. I do need to do that. But you know, you have an issue too, and we both need to address that. Okay. Two mature believers will be like, all right, you know, they'll be able to handle it, right? An immature believer and a mature believer, mature believer is probably going to be the one that's going to be, as Paul says in Titus chapter 2, he's going to be despised, right? He's going to try to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and sound doctrine, and they're not going to like that very much. So thou hypocrite, first do what? First do what? First introspection. Before you open your mouth, you better introspect. You better review your life. You better go through and go, oops. Yeah, I probably should go ahead and get that big old beam out of my eye. That big old issue that I have that I haven't taken care of that everybody knows about. And then he says, notice this. And then shalt thou see clearly to do what? To judge righteous judgment, to cast out the boat out of thy brother's eye. You're helping him, right? You're helping him. You're not looking at him saying, you're going to hell, right? You're helping this brother. So now with the world, there's not even, we don't even have to, they, they know they're condemned, right? People say, no, they don't. They don't know they're condemned. Well, I told you they do. Romans chapter two, and we'll, we'll stop with this for the week. We'll pick back up. But see, Romans chapter two, you say, they don't know they're condemned. Well, I told you, when you're a little kid, you know you do things wrong. And I showed you that example with Noah, and he's up there, and, and I'm saying, hey, buddy, what happened there today at Disney World? Oh, what? And he, like, he knew. He knew exactly what I was talking about. I didn't have to bring up anything other than, you remember. And he knew. He knew exactly. He's like, yeah. I said, you got, you got in trouble? You got an, an aerial ride? A nice climb on the rocks? And, and he starts to cry again. He, gets, he knows that he did what's wrong, right? So he's not even in this list here of being filled with fornication and wickedness and unrighteousness and maliciousness. He just knows that he did something that's, that was wrong. He, shouldn't, he knew before he even climbed that rock he shouldn't have done it, right? He knows not to do that because I know why. He looked right at me before he did it. He looked at me. He gave me a little eye. And then he goes over and walks to the rock and puts two feet, you know, gets one foot up on there, starts to get the other on. The lady goes, ah, 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 no, no, no. And I'm like, oh, he's not going to like that. So look at verse number 32. Notice this. Who knowing the judgment of God. So what I want to state is this. They can know the judgment of God by men who will say, look, that's wrong, and God judges and condemns individuals who do those things, right? That's one way they can know about it. But even deeper than that is the natural condemnation that they have in that guilt-ridden conscience. You can't get rid of that, right? 
And what Satan loves to do for believers, members of the body of Christ, is he loves to take that conscience. And he loves to say like, oh, you're not a believer now. I'm like, well, actually, I am a believer. You're not justified. Well, the Bible says I am justified. And you're not, you're not saved. And he'll like to do all kinds of things to do what? It's the deception that occurs, and that's when you need to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's when you go back and go, no, 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 no. I'm not listening to that nonsense. That's all garbage. That's all bunk. The scripture states that the man is justified by faith, by grace, through faith, or faith are we saved. And that not of ourselves is a gift of God. I'm not, there's, there's no discussion point about justification that's handled, that's taken care of. That is such a critical, crucial issue that you must, you must just absolutely own in your life before you're going to be successful in any other part of ministry or any other part of, of you know, growing and maturing in the faith. Until you have that completely solidified down, right, and you really just have it understood, you're not going to really you know, succeed much. In verse 32 of Romans 2, it's, it's, it's this, who knowing the judgment of God, they know it because it says they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They do it and, and, and do this uh, judgment every day in the court system, right? You think that people who get up in the court system and they get, in, get picked for jury selection, do they think they enjoy it? No, right? Nobody likes the jury selection. They want to sit at home and watch CNN and say, kill him! Shoot them! It's like whenever they have a mass shooting and they and they and you see the guy survives or something. You're like, oh, hurry up! Hope the cops just kill him, right? That's you know, so they always say. Hope the cops just get him. Hope the SWAT team gets him. You know. And then we're like, oh, he has died of uh, an encounter with the police. What does everybody do? Yay! Or the person gets brought into custody. Oh, I can't believe they're gonna bring him into custody. Now we have to go through this whole judgment process with the judge and the jury and blah blah blah. He is guilty, right? You see how that works? You see just how, how crazy it is that they did, they hammer these issues? The good thing is, for now, for now, murder is still, you know, capital crime in the state of Florida. And, and murder, unfortunately not of babies, but murder of, you know, human beings is, is still wrong. And they, and they still go execute judgment against that, but you can see just how wicked our world will get, right? It's going to extend to the murder of other people. You say, that's never going to happen. Go out to Oregon. You can go do it now. No, you can't. Sure. Doctor, this is suicide's been legal there for a long time. No. Yeah. That'll keep going, right? Because the true, if, if, you're, if you're underneath the true idea of liberty, it's your own life. I want to do whatever I want to do with it. I want somebody to kill me. I want somebody to kill me. And you say, well, that would never happen. Well, because you're there making a choice. Well, let's take it to the baby end of things. They don't get to make a choice. You know, the two-facedness on all those issues. Just understand, that stuff ain't going anywhere. It's only going to get worse. So what do we need to do? Stand strong in the faith. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and sound doctrine. Right? Let no man despise thee. It's going to happen. So the judgment issues we'll pick up next week. We'll go through some more uh, and, and try to just, you know, hammer out why Christ is talking about judgment so much now when... When the tribulation is coming, and what is the whole purpose of the tribulation? <laughs> to judge the world for their sin. I mean, not just judge one or two people, it's to judge the world, the Jew and Gentile, for their sin. And we'll get into some verses in the book of Amos. When you start looking at that thing, you go, dude, I want nothing to do with that whole time period. That tribulation sounds horrible, right? It's a real bad time, and that's what Christ is teaching these guys that they're about ready to, you know, get, get into and, and get ready to go into and, and be a part of. And that's some of the difficulty that people have. And, you know, hopefully this has been beneficial. We're, you know, 50 minutes in or 43 minutes in, so we'll pick up next week. All right, let's close the prayer.